Hello, my name is Dan Vilenchik, and I will be presenting the following paper. Principal component analysis is a widely and popular tool for visualization of high dimensional data. The task is to find the direction which maximizes the variance, and this is performed by computing the eigenvector, the leading eigenvector of the population covariance matrix, or what's more common, the leading eigenvector of the sample covariance matrix, sigma hem, which is computed from the data. One concern is consistency. We want the sample PCs, the one computed from the data, to be consistent or to converge to the latent population PCs. While under mild assumptions this is true in the classical setting, where the number of features P is much smaller than the number of sam samples N, <clears throat> this may not be the case in the high dimensional setting, and this phenomenon is also known as the curse of dimensionality. So for example, on the right, we see projection on inconsistent PCs, and on the left, we see what would be a projection on consistent PCs. Right, so we want this figure in our paper. How to proceed? Well, regularization is one popular option, uh, and it many times hinges upon sparsity assumptions. For concreteness, let's fix some, the sparsity assumption. <clears throat> that would be the L0 sparsity, namely the leading PC has at most k non-zero entries. So it's instructive to think of the following population covariance matrix. You have a rank one uh, matrix corresponding to V1 plus white noise. And following would be uh, <clears throat> one such example of a, of a sample covariance matrix uh, where, uh, where everything is almost zero, where it, it corresponds to, uh, to the white noise part with a red square corresponding to the signal. And our task is to find this red square. Now, as we said, if we directly solve PCA, probably PC1 bar will not converge to V1. Therefore, we add sparsity in the form of this constraint, which may restore uh, consistency, but at a computational price. This variant of sparse PCA is NP hard. So to conclude up to this point, we want this figure in our paper. We want to solve sparse PCA in a high dimensional setting, but we don't have enough computational power to perform this task uh, in, the gener in, in, in the general case. So how to proceed? Well, if our problem size is small, we may <coughs> naively search exhaustively over all K by K sub matrices and choose the one that explains the best variance or alternatively use polynomial time heuristics, such as diagonal thresholding, where we take the features with largest variance, or uh, L1 relaxation of the L0 constraint, again, turning the optimization problem to a uh, polynomial time, SDP relaxation, semi-definite programming, or spectral algorithms like covariance thresholding. However, all those algorithms have the follow the polynomial time algorithms have the following undesirable behavior. As the SNR decreases, as the problem become, becomes harder, the accuracy uh, <clears throat> diminishes as well. Now, this is to be expected because this is an NP-hard problem. So we cannot expect a polynomial time algorithm to maintain a, a fixed high accuracy for all instances. But in many cases, what we want is the following trade-off. We want the accuracy to be fixed. We want a guarantee, a lower bound of the accuracy, say at least 90% of the signal is always recovered. And we want the algorithm to be able to trade off running time with SNR. So as the SNR decreases, we allow the algorithm to increase the runtime from polynomial to sub-exponential, maybe exponential, to meet the, uh, the guarantee uh, on the accuracy. Now, uh, we call this new design principle the calibration principle, uh, and that's an anytime algorithm. So we want the algorithm to be able to calibrate the runtime to the problem's difficulty, that's the SNR, the energy, let's say, in the spike direction, 
the computation and resources that you have, your cluster that you bought, cloud computing, and the available time. So if we have one month up to a uh, submission and we have a fancy cluster, we want an algorithm that actually can take advantage of all this time and compute power and produce this figure and not a polynomial time algorithm that runs very fast but gives us useless results. So here is one naive uh, approach. We can run exhaustive search and let it run for a month and then stop and choose the best solution. But as we will see now, we can do much better. The algorithm that we suggest that implements uh, such a calibration, uh, uh, <coughs> calibration scheme is called seed sparse PCA, SSPCA. It's actually a family of algorithms with two hyperparameters, F1 and F2, which we'll discuss shortly. Um, the algorithm is consisted of two algorithms. There's an envelope routine here called SSPCA, which also performs a, an exhaustive search, but not over solutions of size K, but over solutions of size K star, which we call seeds. And K star is smaller than K. So we go over all seeds of size K star, and each seed is being completed greedily. Here, we'll see it in a second. And then the best candidate solution is chosen and returned. And F2 chooser is the measure for the candidate solutions. How do we complete each seed greedily? Well, we look at the seed, and then for every variable, for every feature that's not in the seed, we compute F1 on the submatrix containing submatrix of the seed extended by this single variable. And then we contain, compute F1 for all those, all the P minus K star features. So for example, we compute this for X and Z, and then we see that the value of X is larger than Z, Z, and so X will be added to the partial solution before Z. And so we add <coughs> if Z is added at all, because we add only the K minus K star variables with the largest F1 value. In our analysis and simulation, we chose the following two hyperparameters. So for the envelope, we chose lambda one, the leading eigenvalue of this submatrix, which makes sense. That's exactly uh, the variance explained by a sparse PC with this support with S. And <clears throat> for F1, we chose the covariance of X with the variables or with the variables in the C. Again, remember the red matrix. If S is part of this red submatrix, part of the signal, then it will serve as a honeypot to attract other features in the signal that have high, uh, high variance, high covariance with the seed. Let's move click, click quickly to evaluating and analyzing the algorithm. So this uh, paradigm, the SSPCA framework, is actually a hierarchy of algorithm, depending on K star, interpolating between diagonal thresholding, if we choose K star to be zero, no seed, and exhaustive search if the seed is uh, of size K. The running time which induces this hierarchy is exponential in K star, and it's polynomial when K star is a constant, zero, one, or two, up to the full exhaustive search. Our, the algorithm is easily run in parallel. This is what uh, our code does, and we'll see it in a minute in the simulation. Another question is consistency. Well, we need to choose K star sufficiently large so that the algorithm maintains accuracy, right? This is the S shape that we have. We want to increase the running time frugally so that uh, <coughs> accuracy is maintained. We have a rigorous scaling. We have, we have found the rigorous scaling of K star in the spiked covariance with them. So again, the spike is a K, sp K sparse uh, uh, vector. So here is uh, one example of such vector, which you can have in mind. And the population covariance matrix from which we sample is a rank one, a rank one matrix corresponding to the spike plus the identity, white noise. Right? So the leading eigenvector, eigenvalue is one plus sigma squared, and that's the leading eigenvector. Um, <clears throat> the SNR in the spike covariance model is controlled both by K and sigma. 
the larger sigma, the smaller k, then the larger the SNR. But for simplicity, think of sigma as fixed, let's say one half, and only k, only varying k, varies the SNR. So as the signal is spread over more entries, the problem is harder. So let's uh, review what's known and what's new. <coughs> In here, we ignore constants and k controls the SNR. That's the x-axis and the accuracy is on the y-axis. Uh, so the first result is an information limit result. Right? So, for example, the exhaustive search succeeds in recovering the spike all the way up to an information limit, which occurs at n over log p, beyond which no algorithm is able to recover the spike, regardless of the computational effort. If we restrict, our, restrict ourselves to the polynomial time hierarchy, uh, polynomial time algorithms, then a computational phase transition occurs at square root n. And there's evidence that this is tight, namely every polynomial time algorithm, for example, diagonal thresholding, covariance thresholding, semi-definite programming, may succeed up to this threshold, but not beyond. Okay, and indeed, a covariance thresholding, a spectral algorithm, succeeds up to this threshold in the spiked covariance model. So what we have shown is that, uh, or, or what's known is that diagonal thresholding, which is SSPCA with, and with no seed, it was shown by Johnston and Lou that it succeeds almost up to the information, uh, almost up to the computational threshold. We have shown that a seed of size log n takes you all the way to the information threshold, to the computational threshold, but this is already quasi-polynomial runtime. But as we, will, uh, as we show in the paper, in the simulation part, also for fairly large uh, problem sizes, even n equals p equals 20,000, k star equals 1 suffices to hit the, uh, the, the computational threshold. Now, what's more interesting is what happens from the computational threshold to the information limit. And that was pretty much a complete blank in the spy covariance matrix. And what we show is that this is the scaling of k star. So if k is n to the half plus epsilon, then a seed of size n to the two epsilon time log n suffices to recover the spike accurately up to the information limit. In parallel, Ding et al. obtained this result using another algorithm, and they have also a, a, a rigorous proof uh, rigorous evidence that this scaling is tight, that you cannot do uh, better. So to conclude this part, the runtime of SSPCA scale exponentially, scales exponentially with k over square root n squared, which is much better than the exhaustive search, which is exponential in k. Moving to simulation, we ran our algorithm. In fact, what you see here is an average or median over 50 executions using a cluster of 90 cores. And we thank Rose, J uh, Jonathan Rosenblatt uh, for enabling us to use the cluster. We chose a set of parameters which corresponds to the, to the computational threshold. And how do we know? Well, covariance thresholding, which we know works up to the information threshold, this was proven by <coughs> Deshpande and Montanari, succeeds roughly on half of the instances, right? So we arrive at the computational threshold with this set of parameters. Beta is sigma squared. And what we see is first, we see the calibration uh, principle. As we increase the seed size, the runtime increases. And this is a parallel runtime. So three hours time nine, times 90 cores. So that's almost 270 Pa uh, sequen sequential runtime. So we see that on the one hand, the algorithm invests more and more time, but the accuracy increases in return. So we see here how this principle manifests. We also see that the naive approach of running exhaustive search and preemption, right? So suppose we have three hours on the cluster. So we can run exhaustive search with preemption, but we can do much, much better if we run SSPCA with k star equals three for the same three hours. So we see that our algorithm is much better than the naive uh, approach of preemption. And also compared to 
the polynomial time algorithms, we see, we see that k star equals one is roughly, performs roughly like covariance thresholding and much better than diagonal thresholding, that's k star equals zero, or an L1 uh, relaxation of, uh, <coughs> of sparse PCA. Right, so here, either one or two, we would expect log n, right, to perform like CT, but we see that in practice, one uh, is enough. Okay, so thank you for, uh, for uh, listening to the talk. I hope you uh, enjoyed, that you're healthy, that we'll see each other uh, next year live in code 2021. All the details are in the paper. And uh, bye.